Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, session. I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. It was a, I was hum humbled by the invitation because uh, I've seen the number of uh, very prominent speakers who came here. So I would like to really thank you very much for this. Uh, uh, it's a great opportunity for my organization to express its views. As you know, ITU is the oldest organization of the United Nations family. We celebrated just three days ago, on Friday, 147 years of our existence. And this was an institution that was created in Europe, in, in Paris, by 20 European countries and the US. And uh, it uh, is now has uh, its 100, 193, nine, 193 member states. But we also pride ourselves of being the organization of the UN that has over 700 private companies that are members of the union. And the only difference between private companies and governments is when it comes to voting. And we rarely vote. We only vote, really, when it comes to electing me. And I think that's uh, the least important things, me and the management team, of course, and the members of the, of the, of the council. The union is based on consensus. Of course, from time to time, we may differ. And we will, uh, there are some cases where we have to vote on issues. But uh, we really minimize that. It's, a, it's, a, it's a very to kept to the minimum. Of course, last year, most of you may have heard that in Dubai we have had to do, do a vote, may, uh, to, uh, uh, and that was uh, a reason for a division, uh, for a treaty that was trying to, to broker at the time. And it was unfortunate because we had to vote on an issue that was proposed by the African group, which was saying that all, developing country, all countries, including developing countries, have the right to access information and communication. That normally should be something political. But the whole context was politicized. And uh, of course, during the time it was the issue that was proposed by the African group was supported and defended more uh, by another country that is not friendly to others. I won't name any country here. And because of that country's defense, we went to a, a vote to the, on this issue. It was unfortunate. And I was saying that what is happening? The people, the, the, the North-South uh, cooperation was not there anymore. The solidarity was not there anymore. How can you say that countries don't have the right to communicate? And that's something that shouldn't be politicized at all. And we are a technical organization. It should not be politicized. Uh, we, and in our jargon, we have always uh, been able to agree among ourselves because the issues we are dealing with are technical issues, and uh, all technical, technical problems have a solution, at least one solution. Of course, political problems don't necessarily have single solutions or not have solutions at all. And that we were sliding into political field, which was unfortunate. But of course, uh, the subject uh, of ICT development for sustainable uh, social and economic development is a, a key for uh, today here, especially in Ireland, with the EU presidency, I should say. It's a, it's a very key issue. And Madam Donohue is, uh, has been in charge of uh, the digital agenda in this country. And uh, I believe it's, it's even more relevant for her. This is my phone. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's proving that it's relevant. That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's just a message. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was timely. It was, that was not planned, though. But <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> and uh, this lecture series, probably also the kickoff of this, uh, this week, for me, is very symbolic as well. It's a week of uh, 25th May, which is the African Union celebrating its 50 years. It's a, it's a very uh, important week celebrated all over uh, Africa, and especially here in Ireland, where 
I believe the AIDS in Ireland here has been one of the most effective. I, I'm, you will see in my, my speech here, I'm actually one of those who are against AIDS in general, but I may say that uh, the aid system here in Ireland has been effective, contrary to some other countries where it, more than 80% of the money that is going to, for aid is not, is not even getting out of the country, staying there in the developed countries. So, and it's called aid, and it's no result. And as an African, I was saying in Kigali, uh, back in 2007, my first year as Secretary General, that unfortunately, our independence, since independence, 50 years of independence, we've been basing our development agenda on the three words, aid, assistance, and charity. And it didn't work. If you try something for 50 years, it doesn't work. For God's sake, you change. And the ICT field, ICT sector is one where if you have a very good policy, private sector will come in and invest. I say that because I'm a defender of private sector, not only my organization, has over 700 companies, private companies that are working hand in hand with the governments. But I myself came straight from private sector to ITU. In running, I was saying, I'm, I'm from private sector, I must be good. And they elected me. And therefore, I'm from that culture where we, if we give a good regulatory environment, things will fly. And I'm happy that uh, we have three ambassadors here from Africa of countries that are having are shining examples of things happening in the right way if you do a right uh, regulatory environment. You know, Kenya is one of the countries where uh, ICT is growing fast. Uh, some new services and applications have been born in Kenya and Uganda. The, the M-Pesa, mobile banking, were born, designed, co uh, implemented in Africa and now being re exported. Because we're dealing with uh, innovation here, which is driven by human brain, which is one natural resource that is equally distributed around the world. No nation, culture, race, or, or religion has more or less of that. But you have to train those brains. And especially in software development, when you train people, people from developing countries will be even more innovative. Because on a daily life, they're building softwares on a daily basis just to survive. A software is a survival solution survive a kit, and people are doing that. The M-Pesa came as a solution, a local solution to local problems. People who want to, to, to transfer a uh, very low, small amount of money, $5, $10, for which the current banking system is not fit for. Now, we're talking about mobile wallets uh, in developed countries. That is an exact copy of that. I want to buy a hamburger, I can pay with my, my telephone. It's a small amount of money. Current credit card system or banking system will not be fit for those things. So these are the solutions. So what I'm saying that we're giving the same opportunity today. And Nigeria, look at Nigeria. For five years in a, in a row, Nigeria was number one in the world in terms of mobile growth. You cannot be number one five times, a, five times in a row in a vacuum, you must have done something right. And NCC, Nigerian Communication Commission, which I followed personally very well, having known the first uh, uh, CEO, uh, Ernest Ndukwe, is a personal friend of mine, has done a fantastic job in, invest, in, in attracting investment in a very clean and transparent manner. As a result, competition grew there, and it's still growing. Now, today we have, we're in a world where we're going to reach, by the end of this year, 7 billion mobile subscriptions worldwide. So it means that we have done a lot of good job. And I, of course, my organization has contributed a lot in that because all the spectrum is managed in ITU. Standards are made there. If the, the, work, the, the work, thanks to the work we've been doing in ITU, we have radio, telephones, <coughs> television, and satellites, and cables. And thanks to that, of course, this is one part of the play of the, of the game. There are also other stakeholders as well that come to it that are complementary. And thanks to that work, we can really say, we can say that, that we have enough conditions to grow.
So a lot has been achieved. In the internet, we have 2.5 billion people connected in the world today. But what does that mean? It means even though we've done well, it means two-thirds of the human population is still offline. Two-thirds of the population are cut off from the goodies that will come from the online world. They will not be able to, 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 to trade. They will not be able to access the world's best libraries, not access to, to knowledge. And therefore, they won't be able to grow socially and economically. So we have still a big challenge to face. How do we bring those remaining 4.5 billion people online? How do we do it in an affordable manner and safe manner? Cybersecurity is a great challenge that we will be facing. That is a global phenomenon. We have to face it on the global level. So therefore, I believe that uh, there is a lot of opportunities for international uh, cooperation. We enable by uh, in ITU we have made the standards that enable uh, internet. We're just part of it, part of uh, one of the players, one of the many players. You know, XDSL is a standard made in ITU that enables you to enter the high speed and to access high speed internet through wirelines existing, so that you can people from all uh, walks of life can can really access. We allocate the satellite slots, which means that uh, uh, you can use your GPS devices today, and you can have also you can provide uh, vital uh, safety for transport systems such as uh, 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 aviation and shipping. Those are things that are done in ITU, and therefore we we, we pride ourselves of that and the, the regulatory environment, sharing of best practices, lessons learned elsewhere, everywhere in the world. Because in regulation, there is no perfect model, we should say. Among the 27 EU countries, there are no two countries that have the same model. But they have some common principles that are very important to share. Where we live in an information society, it will be a shame if we make mistakes that were made already somewhere in the world by lack of information. Or if we reinvent something that was invented already for, by lack of information. Then we, we pull all this together, we will then enter together the knowledge society where every citizen has access to information, can use the information, create information, and share it. Those are the four pillars, the four prerequisites for us to enter the knowledge society we are dreaming of. Because every citizen on this planet is a potential source of information. How do we do that? In uh, year 2007, when I, first, well, I was first elected, my first year, I organized what I call the Connect the World series. We started by Africa, Connect Africa in Kigali. And we invited the, the African leaders and the industry leaders. And one of the things we were telling uh, the presidents at the airport upon arrival, I was asking them a very simple question. Mr. President, is it a crime to make profits in your country? They said, of course not. Why are you asking that? I said, well, I have a, over 100, well, 1,000 executives from the CEOs from major corporations here, Gazard. Uh, I've been telling them that, but they would like to hear it from you. Can you put that in your speech? As a result, and they all said it in their speech, it's not come and invest in my country. It's not a crime. As a result, there were, seven, there were $55 billion commitment for, for investment from the private sector, $55 billion. Not aid, not charity, not assistance, but investment. Guess what? If you, people invest in the country, they will create jobs. They will give new services and new applications. And those politicians will be reelected because people will be happy. And that's been the approach in the ICT field. It works. Maybe it won't work in the, in the in a sector like health or education that are not necessarily profit making, but this sector is profit making, then we can let it fly by its own. Another very important thing we did is when we were talking in the UN system about the Millennium Development Goals, Ban Ki-moon 
the Secretary General back in 2009 told us, all the UN heads, please be active so that we can meet the Millennium Development Goals. What is my contribution to it as ITU? I created the Broadband Commission for Digital Development and asked my colleague from UNESCO to join me in doing so. Among the eight goals of the, of the MDGs, goal eight is the only one dealing with ICTs a little bit. It is not even very clearly stated there because it's talking about infrastructure. Now, that goal is likely to be met. How about using that to accelerate toward meeting the other goals? E-health, e-education, e-commerce, e-government. And that's exactly what we did within the framework of the Broadband Commission. And I invited 60 or so commissioners to join me in trying to design some, a plan that we could be distributed worldwide. One of the first things we did, we said, every country needs a national broadband plan. Today, I can safely say, I was two weeks ago in, in uh, Cambodia, and there are 146 countries in the world now to do, make a broadband plan. Of course, it will be, has to be approved by the par parliament in June, but it will finish the, the work with them. That's a way to start moving forward, having a, a very exact plan, a vision 2020. 2015 is already, as uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ward was saying, uh, 2015 is already around the corner. So we're thinking beyond 2015, what's going to do? So a vision 2020 for broadband where they can make sure that there is a level playing field to ensure that there is an, enough investment in that field will be a good thing to do. And we're working on that. Uh, Now, the, the, some of the things that uh, are important when in a broadband world, well, first of all, we'll help the other sectors, low carbon, carbon economy. We're going to help each of the sectors and each of the uh, industries and each of the major crises we've seen over the past few years have their solution through ICT. The, we start with the food crisis. What ICT has to do with the food crisis? Well, the food crisis was not due to, is not due to a lack of food in the world. It's a distribution chain. Some food go around the world two or three times before reaching their destination, adding to the cost and the quality. During the climate change issues, of course, we're not part of a problem. We're part of a solution from, monitor, from satellites that are monitoring the earth to uh, uh, to uh, giving solutions that will save uh, energy consumption, alternatives to transport, video conferencing, and others are means that will help in it. The current financial crisis, we all know the industry, ICT industry is a good example that can be used. The financial crisis was due to total lack of, of regulation in the sector. Our sector does not go through a crisis because it is well regulated. I say well regulated. Why? Because it's not over regulated. Because we're also saying we have to have a light touch regulation in our industry. A heavy handed regulation will kill the industry. And we're exchanging best practices so all, you know, all our regulators come together at the Global Symposium of Regulators annually. Next, next July, we will be, on the 3rd of July, we'll be in Warsaw for the 13th meeting to give an opportunity for them to share their experiences, good and bad ones, so that you don't repeat something, a mistake that was made, or don't reinvent. So each of, and we are talking about the last one thing, we are talking about is sustainable development. Of course, ICT can be a very good example of a possibility, potential for sustainable development and can be used for that. And therefore, we believe that our industry has a lot to offer in that. Many countries like Ireland have based their industry, their, their economy on a digital economy. And that has worked for many years. Of course, there is a slowdown now because of some other factors, but still can be corrected because this industry in Europe, Europe alone, 
we'll need more than 1 million workers for the next five years in the ICT sector alone. Youth unemployment is key, and the ICT is, 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 is for youth. And that's very key for all of our governments. Two-thirds of the new jobs in the world have been created in the ICT sector so far over the past five years, and that trend will continue. Therefore, we have a real potential of uh, making a difference in, our, uh, in, in the sector. And all it takes is to have a good regulatory environment. If you have a good regulatory environment, people will come and invest. Of course, we'll have to address some of the key issues, some of the issues, tax issues that are, issues that are being discussed today by some foreign companies uh, paying their taxes um, or avoiding to pay their taxes in different countries. We know, we know how it works, you know. But those are real things that we need to make sure that we, we solve, we, we tackle those problems in a very frank manner so that we don't kill the whole industry. Otherwise, there will be no investment in infrastructure anymore. Everybody will go for where uh, the, uh, to, to making money and nobody will be invest in the infrastructure. How do we balance that? There's some, some of the key challenges government have to face. At one point in time, government will have to sit down and talk frankly about those things. And those were some thing, things that we debated in Dubai last year during the Wicked Conference. But it was delayed because the people who felt that they should contribute a little bit more wanted to completely dilute the, the, the discussion in taking us in you know, another field that was completely out of our scope. Freedom of speech and, and uh, freedom of expression, which are very important issues, but are dealt with by other UN agencies. And they were playing on the world free. English language is the only language where you can play with that. Your free internet is at stake. And then your freedom is at stake. Free means the same word in English, the same thing in English. It can be the price, it can be the freedom. Any other language that I speak is two different words that don't sound the same way. So you can't put in the, in, you can't mislead people by putting them in their mind that that's one you are going to talk about or the other. But we have seen that. It becomes a new world order. You see one single company driving its national uh, policy, foreign policy. And those are real things. But we have to be realistic in making sure that we don't kill the whole business, that there is room for all of, them, all of, all of the industry to grow, those who are investing in infrastructure, those who are investing in the content coming to, together. People were trying to oppose telecommunication world with the internet world. These are two worlds that need to go together. You want internet access from a new house, from a new building, from a new uh, business. The ISP will ask you if you have a telephone line and will give you telephone, will internet on top of it. And will give you a phone line, free phone line also on top of that so you don't pay money to the, to, to the original service provider actually. If you don't have internet, you do, you don't have a phone line, they will still give you internet by another mean and give you a phone as well, phone line. And 85% of the internet users today are using internet through mobile phones, mobile devices. This is a phone first. But do I have to choose whether it's a phone or an internet service? No, as a consumer, I don't need to have to make that choice. I need both. In fact, it's not a phone only. It's an electronic diary, it's a camera, it's a, it's a video camera, it's a photo camera, it's a, uh, an, an agenda. It's my address book, my everything. Do I have to choose? No. I want a single device that will be used everywhere, that is interoperable anywhere I go, as a consumer, as simple as that. So these two worlds have been working together all this time. They need to continue to work together. And consumers need to bring them, to, to force them to work together, because uh, it's, it's in the interest of the consumers. They are the, uh, 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 and losers of it if there is any fight in it. And I always say the best way to win a war, any war, is to, to avoid it in the first place. You know? And there is room for us to build the bridges necessary, and we're doing those. So I think after Dubai, we all realized we went somehow too far, and we're trying to build bridges now.
Just last week, I had the World Policy Forum on the internet in, a, in, a, in Geneva for one week, for, for three days. And uh, there was no, uh, no division. We all came into agreement. The debates were very frank. Of course, Policy Forum is a, a very low setting, low pressure setting, where we're not negotiating a treaty. Another thing we, we realized in Dubai, which I, I should say here, is the fact that we were negotiating a treaty in a completely new environment, in a multi-stakeholder open environment, which makes it very difficult for negotiators. When negotiating in an environment like this, where the, 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 your debates are webcast, which we did voluntarily, I webcasted all the debates. But the difficulty in that is that if you know that your opponent have made a, pro a proposal that is far left, you make a proposal far right, knowing that you want to settle in the middle. Now, what happened is that your, your, your consumers who are listening to you have heard how far you have asked and seen what you settled with, which is far from that, not knowing what, what the other one has given. They say, oh, you've asked that one that much, and you only got this? And you're a loser. It makes it more difficult for you to negotiate. And therefore, people were more, much more rigid. That was one of the difficulties. But that's, that's the way it is. And another difficulty is, it, is that the fact that uh, uh, when some people know they are being webcast or they are being filmed, they are not talking only to that audience that are in front of them. They are talking to the audience out there. And most of the time, the chairman would have said, OK, get to the point. What do you mean by what you say? Because he was not talking to us in the room. He's addressing his constituency. And that's the problem, some of the problem. That that's the modern world we have to live in. With. So uh, that's why we had such a great difficulty. But again, uh, we have that uh, very uh, good tradition of always coming back together. And I, I'm sure that we all understand some of the issues. What came out of Dubai uh, are very relevant. And Europeans are doing many of them already. Take roaming. Vivian Reading, uh, when she was commissioner, she, 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 she tackled this issue in Europe. We need, it's a global phenomenon, and we need some key principles for operators, for them to agree on lower prices, for consumers not having uh, to have a bill shock when they go home after roaming in a, in a country. Uh, we have issues of accessibility. We have 650 million people in the world with different types of disabilities. And our devices were not meant for them. The devices that we're using now, they were not part of it. Now we have to design to take them into account when designing those networks, services, and applications, and devices. That's a very good thing. No one can dispute whether you have signed the treaty or not. Issues of an emergency a numbering plan when was the last time you went to a country? You don't know what's the emergency number. In case of emergency, you will not be able to help to save a life because you don't know the number to call. You will you'll waste uh, unnecessary three to five minutes that could be sometime make a difference in saving a life. An international emergency number could be like we do for the international dialing call, uh, the, 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 the international the plus, where the machine will convert it to the national, uh, to the international call uh, number sign in the in the country. Those are things we need to do. Those are things that are being discussed even in Europe here. So, uh, uh, maritime safety, all of those issues are that are in the treaty are very good things that I'm sure, whether somebody has signed it or not, they will apply it, and that is very important. And most importantly, the developing countries where. It's most critical as the one affected, and most of them sign it. So I hope, I'm sure that we'll find a way to bridge with those countries who sign or enter it or, or not. By, by 2015, when the uh, treaty enters into force, I'm sure that uh, many more countries will join. I already had two countries that it, that's, that's joined after the, the treaty, and many more are debating at their parliament now, and including European Union, is uh, debating He's asking, EU Parliament has asked his lawyers to look at it and see if it's in contradiction with their, the European laws. And from our assessment, 
or our, our internal assessment. It is not, but we hope we we'll wait to see what will come out of that. And then European it will be left to European countries to decide what they want to do with it. But in any case, for me, there are some intangible uh, principles in there that needs to be uh, adhered to by all countries. Another thing uh, I, will, I should address before I finish is, uh, uh, which is not in my speech here, but uh, is uh, regarding uh, the Europe itself. We are in the middle of, uh, of crisis in some countries. And in the telecom, the telecom sector is one of the most vibrant everywhere in the world today. But is, there is a risk of slowdown in Europe here because there are too many companies. You have 120 companies in Europe. If they don't go through mergers and acquisitions over the next few years, they will not be in a position to talk to the big guys. US has only four companies. China has only three. They, they can be uh, negotiating at larger scale and doing uh, individual uh, bilateral agreements with 120 companies already. It's a lot of effort that is being spent in that. And they're not getting the best, the best uh, deal. And therefore, Europeans will be forced to do that if they want to survive. And that industry will then lead and will recreate, and Europe will be back in leading. That's something that uh, I hope when, uh, while uh, Ireland is uh, occupying the presidency of the European Commission, I think uh, it will be something that uh, will push through. And uh, this year is critical because many countries are going through that curve. There is a tipping point that, uh, that we, we're reaching to now, and then I hope that uh, uh, Europe will look at it. That, that's from our own assessment. I believe that all other regions are doing their own strategies. Uh, we had uh, the Connect the World series in many of the regions. Uh, we had it, uh, the last one was uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Panama for the Americas last year. And uh, before that, we had uh, in March, same year, we had in, uh, in uh, Doha for Qatar for the Arab region, which is an interesting case. I mean, as a result of Connect Africa, we had a pledge of uh, $55 billion commitment uh, of financing in the, in the, of investment in the ICT sector. And by the end of a seven year time, and we'll have a, a summit in Kigali this year called Transform Africa to follow up on that. The, by the end of, by, by that summit, we will, our assessment is that there will be over $70 billion. So by far passing the $55 billion pledge in terms of investment. That's why we have so many submarine cables now in Africa. The whole of Africa is now surrounded by multiple submarine cables, and there are many submarine, many uh, fiber optics that are uh, laid down on the ground as well in many countries. I was in Kenya when they were doing the groundbreaking ceremony from Mombasa to Nairobi. The landing, I was there again for the landing of the of the cable, uh, submarine cable. There was no cable at all two years earlier. There was no cable at all from Cape Town to 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 Cairo on that side, going through the south, the, the, uh, the east, uh, eastern part of the, uh, the continent, continent. Now there are, there are three. The fourth is being laid down. So the highways are there. The infrastructure is being built. Content development will be key into it. Countries like Kenya is building, Kenya is building a whole uh, 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 ICT park, huge ICT park, seven billions, billions of dollars I believe 15 billion of dollars investment in there. It's going to be great. It's going to create a lot of new jobs. A lot of innovation will come out of that. That's very important for all of us. Uh, Connect uh, Arab was a different approach, of course, because the countries have the infrastructure already. Now, how about new services and applications? The, the, assess, the assessment was that there will be a potential investment in the ICT sector only in the Arab region was about $300 billion over the next five to seven years. That will be coming on top of the infrastructure that is already there because they have the money already. And they are, tra they are training people 
there are new universities everywhere that are linked to Western universities and, and, and the Arab region. After 9-11, unfortunately, many uh, Arabs don't travel to Europe anymore. They stay home. You know, so they, they, that, that's, that, that's a, a new phenomenon that's happening. And therefore, there will be a lot of investment in there. There's big potential of investment in Africa and in Latin America as well. The CIS countries are very good in, in, in uh, 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 software development. They have a very well-educated uh, staff, uh, young, young, uh, young, young people. And therefore, they are doing a lot. Of course, you, at the same time, that's the region where you have most pressure for cybersecurity, uh, which is another phenomenon that we need to work on. So youth innovation and uh, youth entrepreneurship will be some of the key drivers that we will see everywhere. And I think Europe will be also part of that. So uh, let me uh, close here by just saying that uh, uh, I'm very happy to see the transformation that is being made by the information and communication technology today that will give the opportunity, the same level playing field to all countries in the world. And those who train the necessary brains are the winners in it. And those who take the necessary step to have a good policy that is attractive to investment are the ones, and Ireland, of course, has been very successful in it so far in Europe. And uh, it was a hub of investment for many years. And I'm sure uh, the current global economic crisis will, will see the end of a tunnel very soon. And uh, uh, the countries that are making the right decisions in attracting investment in private sector will be the winners because we need to create jobs first for the younger generation. And I, and I believe that uh, our sector will play a very key role in it. So in, an, in a conclusion, I would like to say access to information it will be key. Information is the only thing that when you, you share it, it multiplies. Anything else when you share it is divided. And that's the beauty of information. It's not only multiplied by the number of people you, you divide it, you, you, you share it with it more, more, much more because it's exponential, because each and every individual <coughs> will add some value to it. And that's the power of information. And that's the power of our industry we're using. And therefore, we have a great opportunity and that, that will make the world certainly a better place. And a world where everyone have access, can create information, can use it and share it and a world where it's affordable and secure, because security is key to it. Because I don't want to have access where someone can steal my identity. I'm not free anymore if anyone can invade my privacy. So those things are fundamental things that we need to, to tackle. But again, it's a global phenomenon. The criminal may not be even on the crime scene in the ICT field, unfortunately. And the criminal may be in a completely different uh, environment where he is maybe a, a crime, where, he, where, he, uh, where, where his perpetrating the crime may not be a crime. So that's the difficulties we, we're living in. But we have to harmonize things and, and, and come to common agreement. But I may say, since I started working on cybersecurity, because it's one of the uh, tasks that came to ITU after the World Summit on Information Society, the WISIS in Tunis, in Geneva and Tunis, 2003 and 2005, among the 11 action line, the two that were assigned to ITU, the C2, which is on infrastructure, and the C5 on cybersecurity. It was not called cybersecurity, actually. It was called creating a, a confidence and trust in the cyberspace, you know, to, be, to have a, a political jargon on it that everybody can agree on, but the reality is cybersecurity. Uh, when I started dealing with it, I found myself with, uh, in, in uh, having under attack everywhere because there was a lot of ideological, ideological differences, even in defining what is a crime. Take pornography, it may be a crime in some uh, countries that are religiously oriented, be it Christian, Muslim, or, or Jewish, or whatever. Uh, it may not be a crime in a liberal country where no religion is, uh, is uh, dominating. And so we were spending endless time debating in the rooms while criminals are working. So 
it, I finally came to, I had to find a common denominator where everyone would agree to do something so that we could work as we talk. Children. When I came with the initiative, Child on Land Protection, or COP in short, everybody said, oh, that's something that's urgent. And they are the biggest users of the net. Of the net. There's one likely to give information on themselves or their families to people they have never met. And uh, they are the future generations, and we need to protect them. And they are very naive. They can be naively giving information. And therefore, uh, unfortunately, they are more educated on ICT than us, the parents, and therefore it makes it very difficult. How do I do, do, do train them? In, uh, while they're going in the, in the street, we teach them some basic rules. Don't follow a stranger. Don't accept a candy from someone you don't know. It could be a drug. But they, they surf in the safety of their bedrooms and their classrooms, you know, out there and we don't give them enough guidance. So uh, those are very key issues. But at least children is a common denominator. So I am saying if we are able to put a good framework to protect children uh, in the cyberspace, the same framework could work for anything else. Of course, having said that, I'm also trying to apply some of the good principles that have already exist, like the Budapest Convention. There are some very good principles that are in there, in the Budapest Convention. There are, of course, some articles in there that are Eurocentric, which is normal. It was meant for Europe in the first place. Now they realize there are very good things that can be shared worldwide. But from Article 35 um, up, which are dealing with uh, really non-substantive non issues like the ratification process, which is important, but it's European, Europeans only. And uh, that gives a second-class citizenship to another one who is, who is not European. And those can be, of course, accommodated. So that's, that's some of the things that uh, are happening in this uh, field now, and I believe that uh, uh, humans have been always able to, been able to, to, to win. The good has been able to win over the bad. That's human, fortunately. And therefore, and while addressing the issues of cybersecurity, the issues of crime on the cyberspace, we should make sure that we also highlight the fact that that the bad part should not overshadow the very good things that come out of it, that are far uh, greater than the bad things that come out of it. We should agree on, on that as well. And that's why we're actually trying to preserve it, because there are very good things in, in it. And those, we could avoid ideological fights. But of course, you always have this uh, uh, issue of uh, some repressive governments who would use anything to watch over their citizens' shoulder, shoulders and rep making some repressive uh, uh, actions that are not good for the citizens, using the same good tools that we're trying to use for to doing good as well. Every coin has two sides, unfortunately. And uh, that, that's something that we have to live with. But, but of course, we have to be very clear in making the uh, those principles very clear for everyone, hoping that some countries will come and adhere to it. So I thank you very much again for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I, I will uh, uh, now, uh, if you uh, want uh, any, any, I will respond to any questions you might have. Thank you very much.